education strategy for the organization, focusing on root causes of food insecurity and assessing solution efficacy. In addition, she is responsible for analytic and flexible learning resources for both internal and external Feeding America audiences. Anne brings a wealth of social science expertise to Feeding America from intersecting fields, including social justice, financial security, poverty alleviation, and workforce development. Previously, she was Director of Research, Evaluation, and monitoring, monitoring at Women's World Banking, where she led a global research team focused on developing and directly delivering mixed methods research and evaluation efforts. She created and implemented innovative approaches to international market intelligence and led the organization's strategic agenda development. Earlier, Erin served as Director of Research and Strategic Learning at the New York Women's Foundation where she led a team that developed organizational research and analytic content focused on applied research to support economic development among nonprofit organizations serving low-income women. Prior to this effort, she had held lead research positions at the Urban Institute and senior strategy roles within the government leading systems change efforts. Erin holds a doctorate in public health and research from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a master's in public policy and evaluation from John Hopkins Policy Studies Institute. She is a trained bioethicist. In her free time, Erin is an avid hiker, loves a good latte over a book, and is engaged in youth mentoring. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her partner. Please help me in welcoming Erin McDonald. so far away right now. All right. How's the summit been going so far? Good? Great. All right. It's a good way to start the week, right? Lots of good learning. I hear that it's been lots of really good conversations. So, um, all right. So we're going to dive in. I'm, I have the pleasure of getting to talk to you about for about 30 minutes around the issue of food insecurity, which is an issue of growing importance and um, concern on a lot of cam college campuses across the country, um, and a lot of work that Feeding America does and is in near and dear to my heart and many of my colleagues at um, our organization. So, so you got my formal kind of like heavy lift um, intro that they like to do, but just as um, big picture, so I, I am I have the pleasure of serving as a, the vice president of research at Feeding America, um, which is the largest nation, or the nation's largest hunger relief organization. And I am thrilled to be here with you today. Um, I am grateful that AHCA is highlighting food security as a broader health issue. It's super important. So just to get us started, I want to start with a number. Across the United States, one in eight people faces hunger. That is 40 million people. And it is everywhere around you, but you may not realize it. It's in your neighborhood as you go to work, as you take your child to the playground, and as you walk across your college campus. In the United States, we often associate struggling with hunger with images of poverty like homeless individuals on city streets. But the sad truth is that hunger extends to individuals and families that look much like you and me. We know that there's a great deal of hidden hunger across our communities, including on college campuses in classrooms, in dorm rooms, and in the homes of many students and staff. The encouraging news is that Feeding America has a national network fighting every day to change this. Before I walk you through how Feeding America and our food bank network are combating hunger across the country, I'd like to set the stage with three things that I'd like you all to walk away with today. So first, I'd like you to walk away with a good understanding of the issue of food insecurity and how it's connected to health and well-being. Second, knowledge of the work that is actively happening across the charitable food system to address campus food insecurity and identify connections to your work. Third, spotlighting how you can take action, from seeking more information to inform your practice to how to partner with your local food bank to provide access to nutritious foods on your campus. Does that sound good? Good plan? Yeah? yeah. OK. I feel like we need to do jumping jacks. It's post-lunch, right? Should we break for that? No? OK, fine. All right, good. Um, OK, we'll get started. So point number one, um, who is Feeding America, and why is food insecurity relevant to each of you? So whether you're familiar with Feeding America, I can absolutely guarantee you that you've come across the work of our network in your community. Feeding America is the nationwide network of 200 food banks and more than 60,000 food pantries and meal programs. We touch every state, county, and territory in the U.S., and we serve 46 million people. 
Our ambitious mission is to feed people facing food insecurity today and work to provide solutions to end hunger tomorrow, which is to shorten the line. That means that we are working to reduce the number of people that need our help because they will have enough food. By a raise of hands, how many of our, our you are familiar with the distinction between a food bank versus a, a food pantry? A few, okay, good, great. Nice to see those hands. So this distinction is important. It's a question that comes up a lot. Um, a food bank is a central hub in a community that is a storehouse for millions of pounds of food and other products that go out into the community. A food pantry, in contrast, functions as the arm that reaches out to the community directly. Every food bank has many community agencies that partner to provide food as grocery and meal programs directly to people who face food insecurity in those communities. With that structure in mind, I want to define what food insecurity is and isn't. Okay? So food insecurity is the lack of consistent, dependable access to enough food for all household members to live active and healthy lives. So you may be thinking, how does hunger fit into this definition? While related, there is actually a clear distinction between hunger and food insecurity. So food insecurity is an economic and social condition when a person does not have enough access to the food that they need. It's measured every year through a national survey of households by the USDA. In contrast, hunger is a physiological condition. It results when a person doesn't have enough food and it's hard to measure. So the takeaway is that we can measure food insecurity and directly find solutions for limited food resources. Hunger is a personal perception that we cannot measure, but we can work to relieve when we're addressing food insecurity. So with that shared understanding kind of setting the stage of the challenge that we're tackling, let's think about the scope of the issue. In the United States, one in eight people and one in six children are food insecure. That's 40 million people. Food insecurity touches every single county in the U.S. and looks different in every county. It ranges from a low of 4% in Loudoun County, Virginia, close by to here, to a high of 36% of all residents in Jefferson County, Mississippi. Okay. We know this all from Feeding America's Map the Meal Gap study. Food insecurity affects many different groups of people, children, seniors, veterans, working families, and college students all experience food insecurity, but they have very different risk factors and resources available to them. We know that certain groups of people may be at greater risk of food insecurity due to other economic and social hardships that they face. This includes disabled adults, single female-headed households, and minority households. So for example, one out of every 10 white households, or one out of every 11, excuse me, white households experiences food insecurity, while one out of every five black households face food insecurity. So there's a difference. So I think we can all appreciate a number. We work in a lot of numbers on a regular basis, but what is the lived experience of food insecurity for um, a household that's facing it? Food insecurity is often a battle of economic choices. In working class households, which actually include the majority of families that we serve through the Feeding America Network, that might mean that a parent goes without food so that their child can eat. It may mean that families make tough choices between food and medicine, keeping the lights on, education expenses, or transportation. All of this assumes that no major budget mishaps are added to the mix, like a car breakdown, a family illness, or an extra tuition bill. Food insecurity is related to poverty, but it's actually not a one-to-one -one relationship. So households that live at or below the federal poverty line, which is only $24,600 a year for a family of four, may not experience food insecurity. In fact, about 61% of the 39 million, or close to 40 million households that live in poverty are actually food secure. Equally, 59% of households who live above the poverty line experience food insecurity. So the reality of this complex relationship is that food insecurity is really the experience of a lack of economic resources in a household. And that's often because the amount of resources available don't, does not match up with the local cost of what it takes to live in a community. 
So research also shows us that it's really hard for families to survive month to month. The food purchased at the beginning of the month, even with support of nutrition assistance supplemental cards, or SNAP, versus the end of the month, when income and benefits dwindle, is markedly different. Healthier choices fall second to simply feeding the family, and fresh produce is bypassed for putting any option, however unhealthy, on the table. So this begs the question, how is, feeding, or is, how is food insecurity tied to health? So this is actually also a very complex relationship, and we know that food insecurity and poor health are closely related. Feeding America study, Hunger in America, showed that 58% of households have at least one member with high blood pressure, and 33% have at least one member with diabetes. We also know that food insecurity is costly for individuals and for the country as a whole. Research has shown that food insecure people have an extra cost of $1,800 in health care every year. This actually builds up to about $77.5 billion in additional health care costs annually across the country as a result of food insecurity. So research has helped us really understand that there's also a lot of negative effects on short and long-term health of individuals that face this challenge. The cycle of food insecurity and chronic disease begins when an individual or a family cannot afford enough nutritious food. The combination of stress and poor nutrition can make disease management even more challenging. Further, the time and money needed to respond to these worsening health crises drain the household budget, leaving little money for essential nutrition and medical care. This causes a cycle to continue. And we know that many families experiencing food insecurity often have several, if not all, factors which makes maintaining health really difficult. It can also take away attention and focus on learning, development, and civic engagement. So the bottom line is really that food insecurity can reduce a person's ability to thrive and feel secure while growing physically, mentally, and socially. We've used research findings to support the important and strong shift that we're making in our network at Feeding America to provide a lot of really healthy food, which is exciting. So in 2017 alone, 71% of all of the food that Feeding America provided met USDA's dietary guideline. We secured a total of 1.5 of billion pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables and provided what equaled 195 million meals of just produce through a regional produce program. So that's a lot of food and a lot of really good food, which is really great. Um, so now that we've painted the really big picture of what the issue is, does everyone feel like you have a good sense of what we're grappling with? Yeah? OK. So I want to look specifically at the college campus, because we know an increasing amount of the challenges that we're facing um, in these environments. So in this context, how does college hunger and health fit into what we're already seeing nationally around the issue of food insecurity? So. If you hadn't noticed, I love data, I love numbers, and I could talk to you all day long about all the details of every single study that's coming out that's happened around this issue. So happy to do that. We obviously don't have time now. But um, one of the things that's really interesting is that there's a growing amount of research happening on the issue of college food insecurity, which is great. It's exciting to me, to my team, to the folks at Feeding America who are really grappling with this issue. So in recent years, there's been a real shift in terms of moving from small single campus studies to multi-campus and broader state reports to really understand the issue. So we're seeing a lot of momentum. There's a lot of dialogue happening on this front. So one of the things that's really important to understand is that measuring food insecurity alone is hard. Measuring food insecurity amongst college students is even harder because it's a really diverse issue. It's a really diverse experience for what we're talking about on campuses, how we measure this issue, the range of different um, college students and what they experience. So that's setting the stage. So studies are reporting that a range of results are coming out. And large studies are reporting that between one third and one half of all students are food insecure. So I should note that these numbers are above the national food security averages in total, okay? And because of the challenge of measuring food insecurity amongst college students, it is really important to remember that these figures may not be accurate and that we have to do more research, okay? So more learning is needed. But arriving at a single number to describe how many college students face food insecurity may not happen soon, 
But it is clear that college food insecurity is an issue that we need to spend a lot of attention and action towards. So I know that in our minds, I've had this misconception in the past, right, that many of us have this image of a college student pulling all-nighters, eating ramen noodles, um, and we know that the argument is that this is a rite of passage, right? But facing hunger is absolutely not a rite of passage, ever, in any context. And food insecurity can hinder productive learning, can lead many students to fail from achieving, their, um, credential, from achieving their credential or earning lower grades than they are truly capable of. And we want all students to have full, healthy college experiences. So while there's a growing number of administrators, faculty, advocates, practitioners, and students mobilizing to address the issue, there continues to be a lot of skeptics who question how is it that so many college students are struggling to make ends meet, right? There are developmental, there are economic, and there are health factors that are related to college food insecurity that are important to understand. So first, from the developmental perspective, there are millions of children who struggle with food insecurity, and the challenges that children face don't disappear once they're in college, okay? And for some, they only get worse or they get greater. More than 12 million children experience food insecurity. And as children, many of them have access to free and reduced school, lunch, and breakfast, but the critical support goes away when students step foot on campus in many cases. And even then, they're not able to make ends meet, right? So Feeding America actually did a, a recent study about teens and food insecurity and explored teens' experiences with um, the issue when, when food is scarce. Many low-income teens that were part of that research um, help us understand that they often don't have the opportunity to go to college. But for those that do, they may continue to struggle with the use of negative coping strategies, strategies once they're enrolled in college in ways that they had learned in order to have access to food when they were teens. Regardless of their need as children or teens, many students that are in college are experiencing independence for the first time and they may not be equipped with resources and skills to manage their new environment, and there's new and often higher cost of being able to have that opportunity. So living away from home for the first time, as we all know, um, with new and greater expenses, the need to balance school and work, having to manage a tight budget and other responsibilities independently can create conditions that result in food insecurity. So second are economic conditions. So we know that college looks really different from the past. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting research around the fact that today, amongst the 17.5 million undergraduate students, 40% of those are 25 or older. 37% are enrolled part-time, and 26% are parents. And many students are likely trying to support themselves as they seek a degree. We know that more low-income students are enrolled in college today than ever before, and that only a small fraction actually will graduate with a degree. We also know that the student loan debt um, in the US is 1.4 trillion, a number that I'm sure is very familiar to all of us and unfortunate, um, and that low income students are more likely to drop out of college for financial reasons, such as not having the right funds to be able to cover the cost of living around student life, including food. Many students consider food to be their most flexible expenditure when determining what to cut from their budgets, and even though it has consequences for academic performance, we're still seeing this trend. So the cost of college today is also continuing to rise, and that we know by 2020, it's going to be an estimated $200,000 for a four-year degree. And many students and families that struggle to make ends meet will have to face higher tuition costs, even though their incomes are not going up. So this actually creates strain not only for students in their food insecurity, but also for households as well that are back home. So one of the most interesting important trends that I'm actually seeing is around the difference in food insecurity um, around the different type of college that a student attends. And we know that the research suggests that students that actually attend two-year colleges or vocational programs are more likely to face food insecurity than adults that are in um, four-year colleges or adults overall. And that this is particularly um, a challenge in economic recessions or periods of economic downturn. So beyond knowing how many students are food insecure, there is still an opportunity to better understand the effects of food insecurity on student health and success. We do know that food insecurity can have a negative impact on health, and it's also associated with poor cognitive function and academic performance. 
There's a strong amount of research that shows that food insecurity affects child development and children's ability to learn and grow. There are fewer studies about adults and who are college students, but more studies are being done and we generally are seeing the same connections. So for instance, there was a recent study that was done um, among students facing food insecurity in college campuses. And we learned that students that are more likely to be food insecure have insufficient money to purchase food, eat unhealthy food, experience barriers to access food, have difficulty concentrating, and have lower academic performance. So all of those pieces of information that we would assume we're seeing in the, the research in terms of being reinforced. So all of these short-term health concerns have compounding effects for long-term opportunity among students. Okay, so to address this question, I really want to, to dive into how are food banks and college partners working to combat hunger um, and food insecurity on college campuses. So it is actually really fitting that we're at GW today um, because this is a campus that really does care. Um, in 2016, GW students developed a pantry to help other students who are struggling with hunger to obtain free food seven days a week, no questions asked. The store, as GW calls it, operates out of the basement of a residence hall here in partnership with our Feeding America Network member, Capital Area Food Bank. The best part of this program is that it works on the honor system. So students come and go freely as they need and it removes the stigma and allows them to keep their dignity intact in terms of having access to food and having no, um, no questions about what that resource needs to look like. So the store actually just celebrated its second year in operation last week and since it opened, it's provided over 70,000 pounds of food to students here. And the partnership has actually created over 50, 58,000 meals to students that have need. And they're ramping up more and more every day. So they're excited about this. When you ask them about their work, there's a lot of what they've done already, but we're doing more. So there's a lot of excitement, which is great. So they also partner with, um, the, the partnership includes DW, American University, and Howard. One of the things that I think is important is to kind of bring the numbers home with the story. And in 2016, there was a Washington Post article that was done about one of the GW college students' experience with hunger. And in that story, it, it, it flagged um, an experience where on a brown paper bag left after getting food at the store, one student wrote, I just want to say thank you. I walked in and I felt terrified. I cried at how many options there were and how many people must care to do this. Bless you all. So, true story um, and really important because it really evidences how we can make the change for every single student that's facing this issue. So, for Feeding America, this goes back to our mission and it involves the thing that we do best, providing food to people in need. And we serve students through various programs across our network. So, students actually make up one in ten adults served through Feeding America's National Food Bank Network. And food banks provide food, but they also support college students by helping them enroll in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, known as SNAP or food stamps, when it's possible in local communities or in states that have that, that um, allowance in the rules. Food banks and their partners also are providing access to other education and economic resources for students and to people who care. Super important. So college pantries often will operate on their own, but a Feeding America food bank can be a really great partner. So food banks have the ability and expertise to deliver food that is healthy to people in need in a safe way at a much lower cost than wholesale. So all those dimensions make it really important to create partnerships between college campuses and food bank partners in those communities. So across the country, campus food pantries are becoming more common and we're distributing food um, on or near college campuses. So the way that that service is provided and the types of food and other resources vary based on donation sources, facilities available, and local needs. And there are a number of really interesting approaches that show the range of innovation and ways that our network is providing service to college students. So I'm gonna give you a flavor of that range. So we're gonna pivot. We'll stop talking about numbers. We'll start talking about ex examples. So does that sound good? Yeah, okay. All right, so first, many of the programs are traditional on-site food distribution approaches, and that means that our food banks are partnering with colleges to create per permanent um, food pantries that operate on a regular basis on those campuses. So I'm gonna highlight a few of these examples. So the work of Feeding Westchester in Texas is a great example of this approach. 
Feeding Westchester hosts a food pantry at a community college there. And they also are developing a teaching garden where they har the harvest there is used to prepare hot meals once a week to college students who are food insecure. A similar approach is present in the Redwood Empire Food Bank in California. The team there is working directly with the local public and junior colleges that have pantries on site. So on a weekly basis, they actually provide produce to campus environments, and the staff is also working with the college to provide SNAP enrollment. So they're helping and expanding that resource and seeing a growing appetite for having a complement of both food and SNAP assistance on campuses. Another approach that includes a mobile or pop-up market, which is a distribution happening off a truck or in a temporary space on campus, is a widely prevalent um, structure of service. Mobile markets are used often to incorporate nudges, which help students to make what we call the healthy choice the easy choice. And that means that it's based on presentation, location, and additional information like fun menu ideas that go alongside different food that are healthy um, and available. So the food bank of Larimer County in Colorado is a really great example of this approach. The food bank partners with the Colorado State University and operates a monthly mobile pantry that serves anywhere from 350 students, faculty, and staff, so it's all inclusive, and over the, over the summer, and over 900 people during the school year. This is part of a broader anti-hunger initiative there, and it actually received the 2018 Division of uh, Students Award in terms of um, a, a really exemplar way of addressing food insecurity on campus. Finally, innovative approaches that meet students where they are and provide resources that address long-term economic stability are a third and growing um, model across the charitable food system. San Antonio Food Bank operates farmers markets, or what they call mercados, partnering with colleges to bring the mercado twice a month to the campus. The food bank also provides $5 vouchers for each student to, to purchase food, um, and the food actually comes from the food bank's own farm. So a combination of meeting students where they are in ways that are effective. A second illustration is the Houston Food Bank. The food bank actually partners with 80% of the colleges in the Houston area and offers programs that includes food scholarships to support students while they're getting their credential. Okay, so we have a flavor of the issue. We've talked about examples of what we're seeing across um, the charitable food system with our food bank partners, working with colleges. And we're going to shift to the third goal that I, I enumerated for today. So what is Feeding America and the other organizations that are in this space doing to learn about and do more to address college hunger today? Feeding America is currently working to expand our understanding of promising and tested approaches to addressing college food insecurity. So that means that over the next two years, in partnership with the Kresge Foundation, we're going to be completing a landscape assessment of 200 food bank members. We're going to document how our network is currently approaching campus food insecurity and finding ways to better serve college students and how we can also provide other resources that go alongside it with that service. So we know in particular that partnership is critical to this space and that given the complexities of being able to work in higher education, it is really important. So as a national organization, we're also really thinking hard about who we should be partnering with and what those partnerships need to look like in order to support our network and to make sure that we're tapping into things that are already happening on college campuses that are really important in their own right. So beyond our own learning objectives, we also are anticipating that there's going to be a GAO study that's released this fall, some of you may have heard about this, um, that is focused on food insecurity in college campuses, which is really important because it's another way of raising the issue um, and getting attention from a lot of really important speakers, policymakers, um, and practitioners around this issue. There's also a lot of other local and national organizations that are tackling this issue in different communities and playing very different roles in being able to provide that insight. And so some of those organizations, um, I'll enumerate them in case they're helpful or you want to take a look further, include um, Swipe at Hunger. Has anyone heard of Swipe at Hunger? Yeah? Cool. Okay. So it's a nonprofit that's really interesting and they are actually allowing students to donate unused meals from their meal plan so that other students can actually have access to those meals that are going um, unused, so that they have access to food. Single stops are actually also connecting students and other vulnerable populations with federal and state resources to help them stay in school, so another long-term and important approach um, to incorporate. 
KUFBA is an organization that is a network of colleges across the U.S. as well. And they are also working to incorporate um, food pantries and food distribution sites across those different partners within their network. Finally, Partnership for a Healthy America is an organization that's working with um, a small number of colleges who are voluntarily stepping forward to challenge themselves to integrate more campus environment resources that support health and well-being. And that could range from food policies to incorporating bike racks on campus to incorporating other food resources that are available. Okay, so based on all of that work that's happening, where do we go next and how do you all get involved in the work that's happening? So Feeding America and our Food Bank Network are going to continue to do research and use that research to understand and address food insecurity in college campuses. We're also going to continue to use innovation and human-centered design approaches so that we can create solutions that many students want and meet them where they are. And then we're going to share those ideas with our food banks and other partners to make those ideas available so that we can do more of that in many different colleges and in partnership with those different, um, those different thought partners. We're also going to continue to invest in sourcing produce and other healthy food options that make health and well-being a really important way of addressing and supporting families that are food insecure. So there are things that all of you can do that can be helpful in terms of supporting this effort. So the first is that you can ensure your college is partnering with your local food bank to access available healthy food. In order to find out who those local food banks are, you can visit our website and there's a location tracker. You can identify who that loca local um, food bank is if that's of interest. You can also identify and put into practice food access solutions that we know are really important to address long and short term um, health outcomes of college students. And those are examples like what we talked about from San Antonio and Houston and other food banks that we highlighted today. You know, the other thing that I'm really interested in is, is how we can also lift up what you're doing on college campuses. And so understanding what the work is that um, your partners and yourselves are doing so that we can become more informed as well about promising practices that you think are important for those working in the charitable food system to be aware of, to understand if that's um, a way to support students. And finally, um, if you're like me, you like data, and we have a range of really interesting visualizations and tools that are available um, through Feeding America to make this issue very clear in terms of understanding it locally amongst your community and to make it available so that you can use that information um, in your work, okay? So um, I'm seeing, I think some people fell victim to post lunchtime, but I'm seeing some good attention, so I think we're good. But just to bring it to a close, to make sure everybody is walking away with those three points that I'm hoping you all um, are really internalizing. The first is that food insecurity is a lack of food um, provided in a way that allows someone to thrive, and it affects every community in the U.S. Food insecurity is closely tied to health and has short and long-term consequences. The second point is that food insecurity touches many college students and that while we still have a lot of learning to do around the scope of this issue, about the challenges and the needs in terms of how we can help address them, we are working really hard to address this challenge together in order to look at short and long-term solutions. The third is that there are solutions that are really important that are actively um, out there in many different college environments and that your campus partners can be involved in terms of helping to create the difference that we're seeing based on that work. Okay, so I'm hoping that a lot of that sunk in, um, that was a lot to take in, um, but I really, I wanted to use this opportunity to, to raise those ideas and then start the conversation. So if any of you have ideas, questions, thoughts, reflections, very happy to start the, the discussion now and then um, make sure that we have information available so you can stay in touch if that's of value. So, great, thanks. Hi. Mm-hmm. 
No, that's such a great point. And I think, and so Alameda um, County Food Bank, which is your local food bank, or one of your local food banks, is an amazing, amazing team really looking at this issue from that perspective as well around how are we actually looking at the intersections of these issues. And college campuses are diverse places. It's not just where students go and learn and live. It's their, their microcosms of the world that we live in, right? It, they're really fascinating. But you know, to your point, it's not just entry level. We all are face a lot of challenges and trade-offs in our life, right? And we could have unexpected costs that come up in our family or um, different needs that we didn't expect the day before. And so the experience can really affect a lot of different people. And I think that one of the things that's really um, important and really nice in terms of the approaches that we're seeing to the point is that we're not exclusively providing resources just to students. One, because that's important for students um, to feel like it's not a stigma around just their experience in isolation, right? But it's also that if we're really supporting the whole community to thrive, we have to support everyone there to thrive as well. So, yeah. Hi. Oh, hi. I just came from the other room. Do I have to? Um, and a colleague um, stopped me and doesn't buy into the food insecurity um, and stated that their belief is that it's bad choices, and students aren't choosing between books and food, they're choosing between um, books and beer. So how would you give some uh, speaking points to that? Because I got him to go from his belief that that affected 99% of the students who define as food insecure to maybe 98.5, uh, so I clearly was not effective. Okay. No, that's good. I, I love those hard to convince folks. They're always the most fun in terms of really engaging in conversation. So, um, so I think that there's, you know, one of the things that we talked about um, in, in my remarks was that there are a lot of folks that question this is an issue that's really relevant for college campuses. Um, importantly, there's a lot of research that is happening to really demonstrate the effect that um, that is the case, that there's a lot of really hard economic choices that students are making. One of the things that I was sharing with um, the folks here that would be you know, helpful probably to your colleague is that a lot of the college campuses that we're seeing are rapidly changing in the nature of who are students, right? So 26% are parents. Um, there's the largest number of low-income students that are, are actually um, going to school now and have the opportunity to attend school, but that doesn't mean that colleges and other households have resources to be able to provide those other financial resources that allow students to go. Um, and it's also very different across very different types of college campus environments. So if you look at two-year colleges or vocational programs relative to private four-year colleges that may have different supports, um, it's a very different issue in very different places. So I would say that really having the conversation about the economic choices that people are making and really breaking that down in, in terms of what it costs is an important place to start. But it's not just about, um, I think we all, we all make good and bad choices in our eating, right? But it's, it's less about that as the issue, it's underlying. Great. All right, well thank you very much. Yeah, Greatly no, appreciate thank you. it.